Bibliosophie. Hello, welcome to my channel. I'm Sophie. These are all the books that I read in February and March. Please forgive me in advance. I think this video might be running a little bit on vibes more than anything else. Perhaps that's always the case. Do I give this disclaimer every time? No, not necessarily. Uh, I didn't read that much in either month, so um, I figured I could do a wrap-up of both months at once. All told, it amounts to uh, 13 books, so it's not too bad. I've been having a hard time a little bit reading. Um, I've mentioned this in a previous video. I made a video about being in a bit of a rut in the end of March, um, and so I'll have talked about some of the books I'm going to mention uh, here in that video. I also really didn't put out much content at all in March or February, uh, so I'm just trying to catch up, get some thoughts about some books, uh, most, yeah, most of which I really, really liked. So let's get to it, shall we? Let's start with February. Uh, the first book I finished was Agua Viva by Clarice Lispector. This one is translated by Stephen Tobler. Um, another alternate title is Stream of Life. I don't know who does the English translation for the older uh, title, if it's also the same. I don't think so. I assume not. Um, anyway, this basically has no plot. Um, this is a very Lispectorian, um, just a series of thoughts uh, on art and life and thinking. Um, yeah, it's just really this long monologue. It's just broken up into paragraphs, basically. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, it was, I really enjoyed reading it. Lots of great lines, great thoughts. Um, I can see it being difficult to get into uh, if you're looking for plot, for instance. Uh, but I think with this book in particular and with a lot of Lispector in general, you just kind of have to keep writing it and just kind of just like read through. Just pardon the pun float through this. Um, I think I would like to reread it again um, soon, actually. Not even, you know, next year or something, but in the next few months. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I'd like to get into more Lispector. This year I have a project to be reading quite a lot of Lispector, um, and so maybe I'm going to reread this one quite, quite soon. Let's see if I actually make good on that promise. Then I read something that's much more plotty, uh, Driver Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk, uh, translated by, excuse me, Antonia Lloyd-Jones. Uh, so, you know, big uh, booktube favorite, big um, book verse favorite, finally picked it up, really enjoyed it. Uh, this is a murder mystery uh, that takes place in a Polish town on the border um, full of kind of reprehensible people. It's in a very kind of hunting, uh, woodsy town. Our main uh, narrator is increasingly insufferable. <laughs> she is a, an older woman. And she has a lot of thoughts about things. And um, I found this a very interesting read because it was very compelling. It, it it drags in some ways because it's pretty repetitive and redundant in terms of what happens. Um, and what was interesting for me about it was just how much I disliked everybody, including our main character, but also how that didn't really impact my enjoyment of the book. Um, my my relationship to the character I think is interesting because I agree with a lot of aspects of what she believes and to a certain extent says and then something's really not uh, or I agree with her fundamentally but not necessarily in the ways in which she manifests it. Uh, she makes a lot of good points about uh, how we treat animals, how we treat women, how we treat older women, how we treat people in general. Um, and yet, 
<laughs> she, I really dislike her. Uh, so it's, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. Um, a very, an experience, I don't know if the author meant it to be, but there was this meta experience of feeling compromised as a reader uh, that I found very interesting, where you can't just ally yourself simply or simplistically with, you know, this is the right side and this is the wrong side and these are the good people and these are the bad people because the good people are quite annoying. Uh, I read this nominally as a buddy read um, with Kieran Reader, um, although we didn't talk all that much about it. I haven't been tremendously good at being a buddy read companion. I'm sorry for my various buddies out there. Um, some of you are better at reading with buddies than I am. I also just sort of have been not that great at reading in general this year. All right, I can see that I'm several minutes into my video. I need to, I need to pick it up. Uh, the next book I read, what I listened to was The Rabbit Hutch uh, by uh, Tess Gunty. This came out last year. It's gotten a fair amount of love on booktube. Um, I first got into it because of Iggy, uh, who really, really recommended it. And I really liked it. This is a multi-perspective uh, novel uh, centered around kind of events leading up to a spectacular evening, let's say. And I really mean that in the like a phenom phenomenological way even. Uh, it centers most of all around a young woman uh, who has renamed herself Blondine um, and who's really obsessed with saints and their martyrdoms, um, and it goes into her backstory, her uh, high school experience especially, and then various other characters around her, but then also people more satellite. It really focuses around the Rabbit Hutch, which is the building that Blandine lives in with several roommates, um, La Lapinière, it's um, like a projects housing complex, um, and various other inhabitants of the complex and really also around this um, depressed Midwest town, uh, Vaca Vale, in which they're located, um, where the presumably fictional uh, Zorn uh, auto industry really built up the town and then went bust and left behind kind of a husk of an economy. Uh, so it's a very familiar um, Midwest American tale of, you know, industry building a town and then collapsing and the town collapsing along with it. Uh, I really liked it. I really, really liked the audiobook. I believe it's narrated by Gunty herself. And it was, um, oh, it's yes, it's narrated by several people actually because of the several characters um, and it was a great audiobook experience so I can recommend it specifically. The next book I read was If an Egyptian Cannot Speak English by Noor Nega. Uh, this first came into my radar, up on my radar, what's the idiom I'm looking for? Help me out, but then your own time. Um, because uh, Jaren was reading it and liked it a lot. I also liked it a lot. This is also a multi, -per a dual perspective novel, um, very meta. Uh, one of the characters is Noor Nega herself, basically, and by the end it becomes increasingly much auto-fictional, or at least seemingly auto-fictional and meta-fictional. Um, but we get a dual perspective love story of sorts. Um, she is an American woman from New York uh, whose parents are Egyptian. She is of Egyptian descent, um, but really has grown up in an American world and a privileged American world. She moves to Cairo um, as a hot, liberal, educated young woman. Uh, there she meets a uh, young man from a small um, Egyptian village, and uh, there's a lot of culture clash, basically. 
uh, between them, for them in Cairo, because both of them have a very different upbringing from what they're currently living. He's been in Cairo already for um, a while, um, and it's very much about what, how stories are told. Um, one of the main, main themes is, is the trustworthiness of narrators because you get the story from both of their perspectives. Um, you get very different stories in some ways about the same events. Um, some of those events are very difficult to deal with. Uh, there's definitely an abusive uh, aspect to their relationship. There's also a lot of um, self-exploration about the nature of privilege and of pretense and of um, of truth, of legitimacy, of um, a fight. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm not going to say too much about it, actually, and especially kind of where it goes. Um, I think it's it can be a very uncomfortable read uh, in some ways for various reasons, uh, but it's hard to really like the characters, but I also find that it's hard to dislike the characters in a way that I find uh, very interesting. It also, in a sort of um, meta-fictional way, forces you to interrogate your own relationship to to power, to your own power, to um, who has power in a situation, um, to privilege, to abuse, etc. Uh, then I read Punks, New and Selected Poems by John Keane. I first uh, heard of this collection from Matthew Sharapa. Uh, this is a wonderful collection of poems um, by a poet that I like a lot, John Keane. Uh, and this is just really great. Um, very, very centered in a time and place, uh, in bodies, in relationships between bodies, in relationships between people, and keen to himself and keen to others. Um, if you know San Francisco, Boston, or New York, or all of the above, as I kind of do, um, I think you'll get a particular um, kind of frisson of familiarity, uh, even though he's not describing places that I know at times that I know them, there's still a really recognizable thing there. Um, for instance, I haven't thought of Smoots, if you know Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Massa Bridge um, in a while. So that was great. And finally, to round off February, I finished uh, the biography of Thelonious Monk, This Chunky Boy, uh, by Robin D.G. Kelly. I've talked about it a little bit in previous videos. Uh, this is a really wonderful biography of the jazz legend and the context of his art and his life in New York City um, in the jazz scene um, in the United States in general, but especially in New York uh, in the 20th century, and it was great. I really, really enjoyed it. A lot of um, connection to social uh, change and social realities and obviously racial uh, realities and um, yeah, it was very good. All right, that finishes off February. March. March, um, if you watched my springtime reading slum video, uh, you know that as of the last few, like, as of mid-March, I hadn't finished a single book, or really started a single book. Um, and so I read all of the books that I read in March and the back half thereof. 
The first book I finished was Sirens and Muses by Antonia Angris. I talked about that at length in uh, my Reading Slump vlog that I'll link to. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It is a novel that takes place also with multiple perspectives. Wow, this is, uh, I'm reading a lot of multi-perspective novels. Um, maybe that's the hot thing to do. Um, it centers around students and one teacher of a very elitist um, Northeastern art school and uh, their experience both at the school and then outside of it afterwards, uh, their relationships to one another, their relationship to making art, um, to commerce and the art market. This takes place in 2011. Um, and so it also interacts with uh, Occupy Wall Street and questions of also privilege and class and um, the, the market of art uh, as well as the creation of art. I mentioned in my vlog also that one of my favorite motifs of it, of the book, was um, the, the interaction of muse and maker and who kind of has the ownership of uh, a piece of art to a certain extent and of a person who is represented um, or who inspires a piece of art. All right, that's pretty good. Uh, the second book I finished in March was Strangers to Ourselves, Unsettled Minds and the Stories That Make Us by Rachel Aviv. Uh, this is nonfiction. It is a series of profiles of uh, people living with mental illness or who have lived with mental illness. And uh, Aviv specifically is looking to explore the way that we narrativize mental illness um, and how mental illness narrativizes who we are versus how who we are narrativizes our mental illness. Uh, so in all of the case studies that she uh, explores, it's a more complicated situation than just, well, this person has this um, supposed uh, neurological disorder or something, and that is the end of that story. There's very much a, um, a back and forth of who a person is kind of informs how they're perceived and how they're perceived and how they are um, uh, ba -ba 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 -bum, diagnosed, that's the word I'm looking for, also informs their illness. Um, so the kind of blurry area of who we are, who people are uh, amidst uh, mental order and disorder, let's say. Then I read After Sappho by Selby Wynne Schwartz. Um, this was also vaguely multi-perspective in that it's a kind of generalized uh, first-person plural narrator. It's um, kind of a look through uh, feminist uh, and specifically sapphic feminist history of predominantly um, the late 19th century and early 20th century, predominantly from Italian um, Paris-based and then to a certain extent also London-based um, kind of groups of literary women um, and artists who came together and um, wrote things, made things, a lot of poets, authors, etc. So it's sort of the the narratives of a bunch of female um, writers, makers that you probably know of, people like Virginia Woolf, for instance, Isadora Duncan, uh, and then some that you might not have heard of. There's a great um, bibliography, essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, um, at the end that has uh, a very good series, uh, kind of could be a very good further reading uh, list. I quite liked this, did not love it. I'm not sure. I still, I was a little ambivalent about it in the vlog in which I read it. I remain a little ambivalent in which I 
really really love it because it's very much made for me and then also I'm sort of frustrated by some of its limitations and also very much acknowledge that it's just not for everyone and that's fine. So generally a very good experience, a fast read uh, because it's very very uh, vignette-y if you can see. Um, I finished Close to the Knives. I actually have it somewhere but I didn't well, it's also a library book that is not an interesting cover. Uh, a Memoir of Disintegration uh, by David Wonorovich. Uh, this is a series of essays and um, kind of journal entries of uh, Wonorovich's life, uh, his exploration of what it means to be um, very much a a person on the periphery in in all sorts of ways as a gay man um, in the United States um, exploring poverty and loneliness and um, uh, what's the word danger uh, art uh, feeling at odds with yourself and your environment. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, I have been meaning to read it for a while, uh, mostly from having read Olivia Lang, who talks a fair amount about Wonorovich in specifically The Lonely City, which I've already talked about, uh, but it was good to read uh, the, the work itself. Um, I feel like I could say so much more about it, but then I think I'm gonna fall into a bit of a rabbit hole. Uh, so yes, kind of alienation, um, danger. There's, there's really, really a sense of foreboding and danger throughout the essays and of, and of disintegration, really, um, of systems, of structures, and of self. Um, the the subtitle, is that? Yeah, I guess, um, of the book is a very, very accurate one in so many ways. And then I reread uh, The Idiot by Elif Bachaman. I actually own this somewhere, but I listened to it. I didn't reread it, uh, so I never took it off my shelves. Um, I listened to it as read by the author. I read this when it came out or shortly after it came out a few years ago um, and I listened to it and really enjoyed it. Um, I mostly listened to it because I wanted to read either or, which, spoiler alert, I have read actually at the beginning of this month. I listened to it also. So I wanted to re-familiarize myself with uh, number one in the um, series. Uh, this is a campus novel for the most part, um, very much based on uh, Bachman's life. Um, it takes place at Harvard in uh, the late 90s, latter 90s. Um, it's very much, it's, it's in some ways a um, almost an epistolary novel or it's like centered around what would be an epistolary novel, but it's around email. Um, so it's a college freshman who is very smart and also very much an idiot, uh, very naive in some ways, very disaffected, and having a hard time adjusting. Um, I'm going to tell you already, I prefer either or. I, I had liked fine The Idiot when I first read it. I liked it fine again. Um, it was nice to listen to. It's a lot funnier than I remember it being, and it might have been because I was listening to it this time. Um, but it's also just like fine um, in some ways. And either or hit me more. Um, I also prefer the first half or so of the book, which takes place at Harvard, as opposed to later on when uh, she goes to Hungary. Um, although that that definitely had its um, moments. So yeah, I'm glad I re-explored that book. And finally, to finish off the month, just before the end of March, 
I finished Not Si Cher, Vieille Dame Auteur um, by Anne Serre. I don't know why I'm looking down here because I have it right here. These are my notes of what books I read. Uh, this is very short. It actually took me a, a bizarrely long time to read because I was reading it in tiny, tiny chunks. Uh, and I did a disservice to this book by reading it that way. Um, I had a bit of a hard time getting into it, I think, because I was reading it in 20 to 30 page intervals um, every week or two for like two months, which is a terrible way to read a book. Uh, it's also extremely meta. I'm going to try to arrange for myself all the layers of... It's about narrative, essentially, and how we construct narrative. Because this is the story of an old author. She is being interviewed by a documentary crew who are helping her um, kind of parse together the notes and parts of a draft of a book that she never published. In that book, um, there is sort of a version of her talking about a story kind of of love and of her youth in which she also has a narrator uh, who is a very sort of she is talking about her narrator um so there are just all of these layers of person talking about a person narrating something because this is also in first person so if you want to try to get all of the layers we have Anser, the author writing a narrator, having a relationship to an author who herself has written a book in which she has a relationship to a narrator. So it's just, <laughs> it's just very many layers of uh, metafictional um, stuff to sift through, has some very lovely moments, um, and I, you know, I, this is a kind of narrative that I like. What, is, what does it mean to tell stories and have different layers of ourselves in different iterations and different layers of ourselves from different times? Because it's very much an exploration of past selves, um, and the narrative of past selves that we leave behind to a certain extent. So yes, that was the last book I finished in March. Okay, those are all the books I read in February and March. How did I do? Bye! <laughs>